Aziza, I wanted to, um, I, I can just see and, um, and hear uh, the pride and sense of accomplishment in Eric's voice about how um, happy he is that you and, and this committee have come to, and, and remarkably quickly, I might add. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you more specifically about maybe a, a success story to date. Um, so many of the things I know uh, when you talk about the committee, you're talking about employees, you're talking about um, career growth within the organization, you're talking about patient interactions and cultural sensitivity. Um, some of that takes time. Th those are long term objectives, not short term. But uh, most committees aren't content with just long term. They want long and short term. So can you share with us uh, some just a short term success story, something you've already seen? Um, that shows that the committee's working and really gives you that encouragement to, yeah, let's keep this going. Um, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that I would say is when we first started to develop the Diversity and Inclusion Council and even the BCRG, there was a lot of hesitancy, which rightfully so, right? Um, a lot of people were skeptical. They were questioning. They did not have the trust that we really needed in order to be able to make this succeed, right? You want people to be open armed and, you know, honestly and respectfully they weren't, right? Um, I think that that has done a complete 360. We did webinars and webcasts, we did Q and A, we were very open. Um, Eric and I have our emails publicly. I mean, people have messaged us with concerns and suggestions and all of that and word of mouth, right? So to me, we've already succeeded in that aspect because our caregivers now know that they that they know who to go to. So if something's wrong, I'll get an email and, I, and it'll say, Aziza, help me. You know, I need to know where to go for this type of concern or anything like that. And, and Eric too. And the fact that caregivers felt like they could email Eric and myself directly, let us know that we built that trust environment. And to me, that's success. I love what you all are doing. I shared with Eric that my one of my best friends in high school is an African American uh, that was raised, uh, adopted, and raised by a Caucasian family, and then went away to college, learned about his heritage, and now he's an African American history teacher. And last summer, I interviewed him for my podcast, and it went viral. And so um, I reached out to him and said, "Hey, do you want to maybe do a show where we talk about things that other people are uncomfortable talking about?" And so we, we've done, a, I don't know, 15 or 20 shows. And, and I said to him, I said, look, in the podcasting world, there has to be a sense of lightheartedness or people might not work. So we named it Things White Guys Say. And you can find it online at thingswhiteguyssay.com. And what's funny is the topics that we were choosing, he finally said, no, look, we have to talk about Things White Guys Say, right? Um, so we can get them open and show people that, look, we can have a discussion. And, and I really heard that from you a little bit in saying initially there was... I don't know if discomfort or or just hey let's uh, you know figure this out uh, and it sounds like you guys are doing the same thing by promoting a conversation to get everyone on the same page uh, to educate folks and I'm I'm really encouraged by that because it it's frustrating during any election year that for whatever reason the media seems to drive a wedge in that so any effort to bring that back together um, Eric have you seen any um, um, success or is this either of you where where there were folks who maybe just couldn't see eye to eye on an issue and through this committee and your advocacy you were not able to uh, just able to get them to to work together but uh, really to accomplish something together that might not have been possible otherwise I think we're you know I'll, I'll let Aziza respond to this as well I think we're at the early stages I think right now we're going through um, not only an education process to understand one another and our beautiful cultures, but you know, also a healing process. Uh, and part of that healing is listening to what people have suffered through. You know, that you don't know what's going on in somebody's life. You don't know that when they're driving down the street and there's a police car behind them that they're frightened. I don't feel frightened when there's a police car behind me but a lot of my colleagues do. And so part of this is trying to listen and understand what that feels like. There are other places that I may go that I feel frightened, um, but we don't all have the same awful experiences. And so understanding that from one another is part of this healing process so that we can embrace each other and support each other. 
though I don't, I don't know, Aziza, what do you think? Have there been, uh, you know, examples of this that we've dealt with so far? Um, I can think of two off the top of my head. One of them, I think, um, is a lot more relevant to the topic, which would be um, in the BCRG, when it was first forming, um, there was a lot of hesitancy, right, about how much we wanted to put our face out there, how much we wanted to be known. And within the group, I think that there was dialogue and and concern on what we should and shouldn't say and how we should handle that type of scenario. And, and one of the topics that came up was pushing for a black candidate as a final candidate in the interviewing process. And on one end, some people thought, let's just say people of color and or women. And on the other end, they pushed for black caregivers. And at the end, when we presented the, the, the uh, concept to our upper leaders, which would be Eric and Kevin Manaman now, um, it was 100% support, black caregiver, we support it 100%, let's do it. And I think that that really closes the heart to feel like, okay, you really do love and believe in what I am saying. Um, a lot of times as a black caregiver or as a black person, I feel like when you say diversity, we think white women and that's not all there is. I really am glad that we were able to push for a black caregiver and there is support there. Well, and I think it really supports the mission that Eric's mentioned several times that uh, the ultimate goal is in the ministry is for your caregivers to uh, look just like and understand and have the same emotions as the patients they're caring for. And that's easier said than um, done, for sure. Uh, but one of the things, Aziza, I love that you just shared that I've learned in the last year through hosting this podcast with my, my high school buddy is, um, as you pointed out, uh, the fact that we're having these conversations is progress in itself, right? And that we're comfortable having him. You started to point out something similar that I think Eric touched on too, is when Jerome shared with me, um, based on some of my questions, hey, Josh, the history of Latino inequality is much different than the history of African-American inequality. And we're not going to say one's worse or or better, we're just gonna say they're different and they need to be addressed separately. Um, so have you guys gotten any pushback on on that specifically? Hey, are we talking about all equality, inclusivity, or is it just specific to um, certain groups? So can you address that? You know, I, I don't think we've gotten a specific pushback, but I think we've gotta be deliberate that when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we're talking about people of color we're talking about people that uh, you know are uh, are within our within the different cultures that we experience together. It's it's not about white people. I know that's hard for us to accept and even <laughs> say out loud, but the lack of diversity, or let me put it this way, the lack of inclusion, has not been about white people. It's about our other cultures. And frankly, I was taught by a member of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council to use the word cultures because they are, we're all human beings. We all look different. Josh, you and I don't look alike. And Aziza, you and I don't look alike. But you know, when you get right down to it, we all have blood flowing through our veins. We all have a brain in our head and we all wanna be loved and be healthy. And so, you know, inclusion right now needs to be more about our other cultures and not just uh, the, the ease of saying it's about all of us. That's a certain cop out. 